Psychologist Dr. Alfred Adler holds an interesting theory of individual psychology. When dealing with people, he says, trust only in movement. Life happens at the level of action. In fact, Adler goes on to say, we are not what we say, but we are what we do. What we do, he says, is the real key to our intentions. Trust only in movement. John MacArthur responds to Adler's statement saying he has discovered what the Word of God teaches. He has discovered what James is saying here. He has observed in human behavior from the viewpoint of psychology that the only real revelation of a person is through that person's behavior. To sort of paraphrase James, faith plus nothing equals nothing. Welcome back ladies to Shoe Leather Faith our study in the book of James. Today we're going to look at James 2, verse 14 to 26. Faith and Deeds. What does James call faith without works or without deeds? James 2, verse 17, he says, Even so faith, if it has no works, de is dead, being by itself. Verse 20, But you are, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Verse 26, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. You got it, my friends. Faith without works is dead. James now asks us two rhetorical questions about faith without deeds. First in verse 14, InterVarsity Press says the two rhetorical questions about faith without de deeds are one, what good is it? And two, can it save? The first question implies a general lack of any usefulness for faith without actions. The second question specifies a particular use that is lacking, salvation itself. The com combined impact is to declare a thorough uselessness of faith without deeds and to make it absolutely clear also to declare its particular uselessness in regard to salvation, which would be the primary point of having faith in the first place. That's from InterVarsity Press. As we approach this passage, one must ask, is there a kind of faith that does not save? Our foundation is the Word of God, so let's look there for the answer. Matthew 3 verses 5 to 10 say, Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from those stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. John, 5, 23 and tw or John 2, 23 to 25, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, Many believed in his names, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them. For he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. In other words, they said they believed, and Jesus said, Your belief is not sufficient unless it involves a new birth, a transformation which leads, leads to obedience in your life. Valid, saving faith has always been verified by fruit, and a false dead faith is indicated by the absence of righteous actions. Let me say that again. Valid, saving faith is always verified by fruit, and a false dead faith is indicated by the absence of righteous actions. So what is non-believing faith? Is there such a thing? In John 3, you find the story of Nicodemus. What did Jesus confront him with? 
Let's read verse 5 and 6. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and calls him rabbi, which indicates he believed who he said he was. He believed he was sent from God, and maybe even that he was the Messiah, but Jesus challenged him with the only requirement that counts. What was it? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Now take note here, Nicodemus says, we believe. <clears throat> it was a whole as a whole group he was speaking, not just as individual faith. Jesus said to him, and, and is saying to all like him, believing is not enough unless you're transformed. There then is such, there is such a thing as non-saving faith. In Mark 4, we read the parable of the sower. Let's look back to where Jesus said about the different so soils. Mark 4, 5 to 9, other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. After the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Do you know people who say they believe but have never truly been saved? <clears throat> How would you describe them? Maybe religious, but they don't really know or understand the Bible. They think they may be Christians, or they can be Christians, without reading the scriptures. I just got a note from a girl I worked with many years ago in response to something I had put on, the, on Facebook. And she said she was offended because she didn't read the Bible, but she thought she felt she was a Christian and she could be without knowing what the Bible said. Very, very sad. Uh, it, it shows a form of godliness, but no understanding. It's people that are concerned with the attention and praise that their service gets. They're working hard, sometimes frantically, to earn salvation and keep it. Good living people, but, they, but if push comes to shove, they would switch sides in order to survive. <clears throat> On what grounds can we make a judgment about their actual standing with God? Well, Matthew 7, 15 to 20 says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Grapes are not gathered from, the, from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruit. We are not to be not to judge or be the judge. God is the judge, but we are to be fruit inspectors. If you're unsure or um, you're unsure or their lives belie their words, then pray for their salvation and share Christ. Treat them as unbelievers. <clears throat> like Nicodemus, they might believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They might believe in the miracles that he did. They might even believe in the name of Jesus. They may believe that Jesus sent, was sent from God. They may believe in doing good things and serving God. They may actually be in ministry or service for him. So what actually is the requirement to be able to enter into the presence of the Lord? Think about some of our Old Testament greats. Moses, in Exodus 3, 5, he had to be holy in order to even stand in the presence of the Holy God. God called him out of the bush, it says, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Isaiah, and when, and when he saw the Lord, the Holy Lord, he said in Isaiah 6, verse 3 to 7, And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. Then, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity has taken away, and your sins are forgiven. Ephesians 4, verse 24, commands us to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. No man ever enters the presence of the Lord without holiness, 
Why? Because God is holy and cannot be in the presence of sin. But justification must come have with it more than just forensic or a legal statement about your position. It must have with it real sanctification. So that saving faith is manifested in the works that I do that spring from that sanctification. That's a big fancy word, sanctification. What does it mean? Sanctification, or in its verb form, sanctify, literally means to set apart for a special use or a purpose. That is to make holy or sacred. Um, therefore, sanctification refers to the state or the process of being set apart, made holy, as a vessel full of God's Holy Spirit. This is not something we can do on our own. We can't work to have it. We can't earn it or buy it. It's only through the free gift of God in Jesus that we can become sanctified. Romans 5, 1, therefore, having been justified by faith or sanctified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus stands in for us. He is the payment of what we owe. He is our justification. Only Jesus, nothing else. What must a person do to enter the kingdom of God then? Acts 16, verse 30 to 31 says, After he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Okay, you say, well, <clears throat> what do I have to believe? One, I have to believe I'm a sinner, separated from God because of my sinful nature. Second, well, Romans 3.23 tells me, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The second belief, I need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and he paid the penalty or the payment for my sin. John 3.16, that's a familiar verse for many. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Third, we need to believe the only way to be right with God is to accept what Jesus did for me on the cross in payment for my sin. Accept that personally and yield it into my life. It's not just blanket coverage. It is personal acceptance. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one no one comes to the Father but through me. What happens when we're saved? By the blood of Christ, we become new creatures or creations. Our old, the old sinful Beth is gone and redeemed. A redeemed, forgiven daughter of the King has come. 1 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now that does not mean that I'm perfect. That's far from the truth. Just ask my husband. What it means is that I'm forgiven for my sin, my sinfulness forever, and given the power to live and to stand against the sinful desires that will come through the blood of Christ's payment for my sin. There are two aspects to sanctification. One is positional. The instant I yield my life and will over to God, he saves me. Once and for all, it's done, it's finished, it's a sure thing, there's no turning back. The other part of sanctification or aspect is practical sanctification. As I live my life, Christ gives me the power to become more and more like him in my everyday walk. I am becoming more like the Savior. I'm not perfect, but he is working in my heart to make me more like him until the day that I die and go home to meet my Lord face to face when the final cleanup will happen. It is me walking in obedience to Christ because I'm his child, and he helping me to grow up in him, to become more like him. It's a marvelous process, and it's demonstrated through obedience to God acted out in my daily walk. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice that, that is acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good 
and acceptable and perfect. Matthew 8, 31 and 32. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you truly are disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free and so much more. I'm going to borrow some of those terrific, more terrific points from John MacArthur about faith and true, true faith and dead faith. He says, the church of Jesus Christ must deal with the soul damning impression that a simple knowledge of the gospel is equal to acceptance of saving faith. We must deal with deception and a delusion that knowing the truth equals redemption. It's almost as if people think that if you don't, what you don't deny, you must believe, and that would be sufficient. James will not permit any such deception to go unchallenged. People who believe the facts of the gospel but make no irrevocable commitment to shun sin and serve the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, that commitment is empowered by the saving work itself and must be confronted by the reality of their state. In fact, the whole of the epistle written by James is a series of tests by which you can evaluate whether your faith is living faith or whether it's dead faith. James gives us five tests to see if we truly have living faith in Christ. The first one is in chapter 1, verse 1 to 12. It's the test of trials. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brethren, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize they've come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. The second one is temptation. When you're facing temptation, and it talks about that in, in chapter 1, verse 13 to 18. The third response is the response to his word in chapter 1, 19 to 27. The fourth is the response to the poor and the needy in chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. It's as you treat them, and that's how you are treating me, and you're showing me that you love me by, by loving others. The fifth is the test of works, which we talked about last last session. Faith without works is dead. James also gives the mark of a dead faith. The mark is empty confession. What use is it, my brethren, he says, if someone says he has faith but has no works, can their faith save him? Dead faith is when we say what we say doesn't match what we do. Put your money where your mouth is. It's nothing but an empty confession and an empty profession, a claim with no evidence. If there are no works and no righteous deeds, you cannot demonstrate a changed life. If when, if when true faith is placed in Christ, we receive a new nature, then that new nature will be evident. The Bible tells us something very special happens to the person who puts their faith and their trust in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. So what does sanctified living look like? Well, it looks like righteous action, righteous behavior, behavior that is obedient to God's word, behavior that demonstrates a godly nature. Living the life is what it does. If we look back in James 1, we can see what some of the righteous works produced in the life of a true believer are. In verse 12, 1 verse 12, he says, patience, endurance under trial. That is one of the righteous works. Verse 18 to 20, proper eager reception to the word of God. Another righteous, righteous work. Verse 21, purity of life. Verse 22, obedience to the scripture. Verse 27, love and compassion for the needy. What good is it to make an empty confession about our saving faith if you don't have any of these qualities evident in your life? Look at John 15. Verses 1 and 2 and then verse 6. How do you think or who do you think Jesus might be speaking of when he talks about the fruitless branch? Think of the men he was speaking to and working with at the time. He, they were his disciples. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dried up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. A Judas disciple represents someone who is outwardly attached, but there's no life flow in him. And therefore, there's no product. Does this mean that we'll be judged on what we do, what we have done? 
We're going to be judged on the basis of what we have done because what we have done and what we do is an indicator of who we are. What we have done is the indicator of if we have true faith in Christ or not. Quickly, in closing, some may argue that the statements of James, particularly 2.26, faith without works is dead, go against the teaching of Paul who tells us in Ephesians 2 that grace you're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not a, not a result of works, so anyone can boast. MacArthur says this dilemma with his statement. May I suggest to you, he says, James and Paul are not standing face to face in confrontation, but they're standing back to back, fighting two common en enemies. Paul is fighting those who want salvation to be by works. James is fighting those who want salvation that doesn't demand anything. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we might walk in them. Again, the point is judgment is on basis of works. Not that our works earn salvation, but that our works manifest whether our faith is truly saving faith. James concludes in chapter 2 verse, with two illustrations, Abraham and Rahab. Genesis 15, 6 tells us that Abraham was converted, became a believer. It says, then he believed in the Lord and it, he reckoned it to him as righteousness. He sanctified him. He saved him. Abraham then demonstrated that faith in Yahweh by his willingness to obey, even if it meant the death of his promised son. He said on the way to the mountain while he's taking Isaac to be offered in sacrifice in response to Isaac's question about dad where's the lamb he says God will provide for himself the lamb for burnt offering my son his positional faith was demonstrated by his practical actions on the faith in, on the trust in God James 2 23 and 24 says and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God you see that man is justified by works not by faith alone. Rahab was the prostitute from Jericho who believed in Messiah and then acted upon that belief, risking her life for the people of God, the people that God had chosen. James 2, 25 and 26 say, In the same way was not Rahab the harlot still also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. What does Hebrews 11.31 say of her? It says, By faith Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. By the way, Rahab was a foreigner. <clears throat> she was a harlot. She was a refugee from Jericho. And she is in the line of Jesus the Messiah. Isn't God's grace wonderful? What a marvelous testimony that is to the genuine faith of this child of God. So my friends, lots to think about and consider. Is my faith real? Is it founded on saving grace only that only Jesus provides? Am I living out that faith in Christ? Can those around me see salvation through the actions, through the fruit of my life? If my life was not demonstrating the power of God's Spirit, and if there is not fruit of that if Spirit, perhaps I do not even know Christ as my Savior. You can hear about faith, but the truthfulness of it has to be seen. And so, James says, look at your works. What do they tell you about your faith? See you next time.